Ottoman Empire once spanned three continents, stretching from Budapest to Basra to Algiers. Founded around 1300, it created a rich, multi-ethnic world that was Islamic in faith and tolerant in practice. But by the early 20th century, the empire was under attack from without and challenged from within. When World War broke out in 1914, the Ottomans had to choose sides. They cast their lot with Germany and Austria and against Britain, France, and Russia. That decision would lead to the empire's final destruction and the creation of the modern Middle East. World War I was the most important political event in the history of the Middle East. And if we look at the Middle East today, we can see the after effects of the First World War up to the present time. World War I was a catastrophe for the Middle East in the sense of famine, in the sense of redrawing boundaries, in the sense of ethnic cleansings that took place during the war and after the war. So in all, it was the major defining experience of the Arab world and the Middle East of the 20th century. First century dawned, the nations of the Middle East, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the occupied territories were mired in seemingly insoluble conflicts. But if their people's roots are ancient, the conflicts are not. One hundred years before, the area was a peaceful backwater of an aging empire. If you had been alive then and had stopped somebody on the street or in the desert or wherever you happened to be and asked them who they were, they would most likely have identified themselves in terms of their religion, their family, their town, or their tribe. But if you were to press him or her, what you would have gotten was that they were citizens of the Ottoman Empire. The notion of Arabness was a notion that was foreign to most Arabs during this period. The Middle East is a concept which was invented uh, by Europeans to denote this part of the world, but it doesn't correspond to what people a century ago thought of the place they were living in. That place was an ancient land crossed and conquered innumerable times. Outsiders called it the Levant, the Holy Land, or Syria and Mesopotamia. The people who filled its cities, plowed its fields, and crossed its deserts were as varied as the names of their homeland. There were substantial non-Arab minorities, Kurds, and of course Christian minorities, Armenians, and, and many others. Uh, and there was a great deal of religious diversity. <laughs> In 1492, when Spain expelled its entire Jewish population, the Ottoman Sultan offered them refuge. In later decades, while European Jews continued to be persecuted, Ottoman Jews lived in relative peace and security alongside their Muslim and Christian neighbors in cities and towns throughout the region. Each city, Damascus, had its own identity, Cairo had its own identity, Aleppo had its own identity, Beirut had its own identity, and I think each center was in many ways a world unto itself. But by the 20th century, a new idea, nationalism, was spreading across the globe. It challenged the already weakened Ottoman Empire's basis for existence. The Ottomans tried to adapt, but World War I stopped them cold. In the clash of empires that followed, the world of the Ottomans would be annihilated. As soon as the British and the French entered the war against the Ottomans, they had a sense that they were going to win this war. They had a sense that the booty of this war would be the provinces 
of the empire and they were determined to partition it amongst themselves. That's what empires do. So why they wanted to take the Middle East is, is, is basically a no-brainer. I mean, basically, why not? And especially considering its strategic importance and, of course, the, the growing realization of, of oil as well. It was already understood at that point that parts of the Middle East had very significant oil reserves. This is something the British uh, and the French very much had in mind in terms of what pieces they wanted. But first, they had to win the war. By 1915, vast European armies were going nowhere fast in the muddy, corpse-lined trenches of the Western Front. The British decided to knock the Ottomans out of the war, bolster their own ally Russia, and win strategic territory while they were at it. But the Ottoman army proved tougher than expected. It handed Britain two humiliating defeats, at Gallipoli on the Mediterranean and Kut on the plains south of Baghdad. There were hundreds of thousands of casualties. The war in the Middle East, which Britain thought would be an easy victory, would not. The British entered the war without knowing very much about the Ottoman Empire or the, or the Middle East. They misunderstood how the Muslim religion functions. They thought, and wrongly thought, that it was governed by one person at the top. The British were terrified when the Ottoman Sultan called for a jihad, a holy war against the West. India, the jewel in the crown of Britain's own empire, had the world's largest Muslim population. They were very, very afraid that the Indians would heed the call for jihad. So they needed somebody who had some religious credentials to issue a counter call, a counter jihad. Sharif Hussein, a tribal chief from Western Arabia, seemed to fit the bill. The Ottomans had appointed him official guardian of Islam's two holiest places, Mecca and Medina, because he descended from the Prophet Muhammad. But they were about to replace him, and Sharif Hussein had to act fast. Hussein, to save himself, had to shift to the Allied side of the war. That was the only, only, only game going then for him. But people in Syria and Damascus and Aleppo were not sort of just sitting around waiting for the Sharif to take action or thinking that without him nothing could happen. Uh, in a sense, he himself promoted his own importance uh, and certainly continued to do so during the war itself. British imperial officials exploited pre-existing national sentiments. They participate in a correspondence with the Sharif of Mecca, Hussein, and they encourage an Arab revolt against Ottoman Turkish domination, and they encouraged the, the rise of national sentiment. The deal struck between Britain and Hussein in late 1915 became known as the Hussein McMahon Correspondence. Henry McMahon, British High Commissioner in Egypt, represented his government. Subject to the modifications stated above, Great Britain is prepared to recognize and uphold the independence of the Arabs in all the regions lying within the frontiers proposed by the Sharif of Mecca. They were basically promising independence. That's at least how the Arabs understood it. And that's the way I would say any reasonable reader of the correspondence uh, would interpret the same thing. The British basically were saying, we'll give you independence, you the Arabs independence, if you rebel against the Turks. But there was no firm commitment and the correspondence was secret. Hussein was no dummy. He himself said it was rather like two people who have decided to inhabit a house, but they haven't decided who gets which rooms. But certainly at the time, in 1915, it was enough for the Arabs to feel they had British support. Uh, and again, the guns and the money and the, uh, the, the British intelligence officers arrived soon thereafter to launch a revolt against the Ottomans and tie down significant Ottoman forces. In June 1916, Sharif Hussein set out to keep his part of the bargain. At first, only his own tribesmen joined him. And after one victory at Mecca, their momentum ground to a halt. 
Sharif Hussein was neither the nationalist nor the military leader Britain thought he was. There was a tendency to think of all Muslims as the same, or assume that just because the Sharif of Mecca was willing to engage in anti-Ottoman activity, that perhaps because he was a Muslim, everybody else would follow suit. Uh, that was a big mistake, as it turned out, because certainly uh, the Arab revolt did not generate widespread you know, revolution all over the empire against the Ottomans. It didn't. But for Britain, the Arab revolt's military value paled beside its political importance. They gave the British political cover to portray themselves not simply as invading colonialists, but as allies of, of the people who were bringing liberation and independence to the Arabs against the oppressive Ottoman yoke, as they portrayed it. The wartime brutality of Ottoman commander Jamal Pasha would play into Britain's hands, turning more Arabs against the empire than the Arab revolt. Jamal became the military ruler of Syria. So he had a, a sort of domain of his own. And he became convinced that there were dangerous, seditious elements at work, Arab and Jewish. Jews were driven out of Jerusalem. And quite a number of Arab leaders were convicted and executed. He uh, wanted to make everyone afraid of him, and he, he did. At the same time, Britain took every opportunity to publicly promote the idea of Arab independence. When it captured Baghdad in early 1917, the local commander announced, our armies do not come into your cities and lands as conquerors or enemies, but as liberators. Unlike the murderous stalemate in Europe, the war in the Middle East was all about movement, especially after General Edmund Allenby, a cavalry officer, arrived to take charge of British forces in April 1917. Allenby approved one daring plan after another. The Australian Light Horse Brigades and other cavalry troops crossed a waterless desert to launch a surprise attack against an Ottoman stronghold in Beersheba. A British officer, T.E. Lawrence, gave Hussein's Arab revolt a jump start and earned the nickname Lawrence of Arabia. With Allenby's blessings, he and the Arabs began blowing up Ottoman trains. Allenby's authority came directly from British Prime Minister David Lloyd George. For years, Great Britain had been uh, uh, engaged in trench warfare on the Western Front, which was terribly destructive of morale. In the Middle East, Lloyd George wanted a Christmas gift for the British people, a victory that would be a Christmas gift, and Jerusalem for Christmas. If Jerusalem was supposed to be a gift for the British, there were lumps of coal in store for the Arabs. Britain had promised them independence, but that was only one of three promises London made about the Middle East. In November, two government documents had hit the world's newspapers. The first was the Sykes-Picot Accord, a secret deal Britain and France had made to divide up the Middle East between them after the war. France would take the Northwest, and Britain the rest. No land was set aside for the Arabs. The British were duplicitous. The British basically uh, were triple dealing. They were promising the Arabs independence. In 1916, they signed a secret agreement with the French, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, where they partition the same region they've promised to the Arabs as an independent state. Even with all the loose language, it's still a promise. Britain was horrified when Sykes-Picot was leaked but it published the third agreement deliberately. The Balfour Declaration supported the goals of yet another nationalist group, Zionists, European Jews who wanted to settle in the Middle East. The Balfour Declaration was a two-sentence declaration saying that the British government supported the establishment in Palestine of a national home for Jews. Those two sentences, as ambiguous as the British tried to make them, have caused a great deal of 
problems ever since in interpretation of problems uh, in terms of people feeling their promises had been betrayed. David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, he wanted there to be a Jewish state because the Bible told him so. And because he, he could see that strategically, if a Jewish state were established with British support, that state could be counted on to be an ally of Britain. At that time, key advisors to American President Woodrow Wilson were Jewish, as were members of Russia's new revolutionary communist government. The British felt that Jews in Russia and Jews in America had a great deal of power, that they were the power behind the throne, and if they could somehow do something that was good for the Jews, they could keep America in the war, and they could keep uh, Russia in the war as well. For Britain, support of Zionism, like Arab nationalism, seemed to be the smart thing and the right thing to do. Anti-Semitic massacres, called pogroms, had been a regular occurrence in Eastern Europe. Most European Jews, given the choice, emigrated to the United States. But the Balfour Declaration gave Zionists a place on the world stage, and the place they wanted was Palestine. The Zionist motto was, a land without a people, for a people without a land. The Zionists had generally thought of Palestine as empty, as an empty land. In the very first years of the 20th century, more than 90% of the population were Arabs, uh, largely Muslim, some Christians among them, and Jews were 5-10% of the population at most. Because their goal was to create in Palestine, in what they saw as the ancestral land of Israel, a Jewish homeland, Zionists tended not to pay attention to the fact that this land was already densely populated by another people, which was at that very same moment awakening to its own national identity, was developing its own nationalist movement. One of the great mysteries is why the Arabs, uh, why Sharif Hussein in particular, continued uh, with the revolt, um, given the fact that the Sykes-Picot Agreement was published, given the fact that he knew about the Balfour Declaration. T.E. Lawrence, Britain's liaison to Hussein's son, Faisal, would play a crucial role. Using half-truths and lies, he argued that it would somehow work out. Faisal basically felt that these agreements notwithstanding, uh, if he could have a political and a military fait accompli on the ground, then these agreements could be renegotiated. And he really, he really believed in that, I think. It was well understood that these promises were contradictory and would be very difficult to reconcile. But it was wartime, and I think the British government thought that uh, their country was fighting for its life in the trenches of France. And was engaged in bitter struggles in the Middle East, and they would do whatever they needed to do to win the war, and then they would sort things out. On December 11th, 1917, one week ahead of schedule, Allenby's forces marched into Jerusalem. It was the beginning of the end of Ottoman control in the Middle East. There would be 10 more months of bitter fighting. In October 1918, British, Australian, and Arab troops descended on Damascus. Faisal arrived at the head of the Arab forces. Once in Damascus, he began organizing an independent Arab state, but General Allenby told him to be patient and trust that Britain and France would treat him fairly. November 1918, the world's guns fell silent, and a war of words began at the Paris Peace Conference, where the winners, Britain and France, would decide who got what, and how to reconcile the contradictory agreements. The United States, a latecomer in the winner's circle, almost ruined its allies' plans. American President Woodrow Wilson arrived with a vision for a post-war world he called the 14 points. One point, national self-determination, captured everyone's attention. Wilson's 14 points were revolutionary. 
in every sense of the word. Once you utter a phrase like self-determination, it takes on a life of its own, and it did. It captured the imagination of Arab nationalists, of nationalists throughout the world, and in many ways defined the 20th century as basically a struggle to put uh, into action the phrase self-determination and the betrayal of that phrase. To satisfy Wilson, Britain and France agreed to let America send a fact-finding team, the King Crane Commission, to the Middle East to ask people what kind of government they wanted. The people in the region were very familiar with British and French colonialism from Egypt next door, from the Gulf region, from Algeria. Mostly people told the King Crane Commission that they prefer independence. Uh, in the long run, it didn't have any great effect because the British and French wanted control of this region. They wanted to divide it up the way they did. And the United States acquiesced. The United States basically said, yes, we had these high principles that President Wilson announced in the course of the war, but when it came to the Middle East, when it came to the Arabs, those principles were, were not considered something that had to be honored. Wilson had a very clear sense that there were, in the end, superior uh, civilizations. There was no equality in the end between the British, for example, and the Arabs. Wilson never for once entertained the idea that these were equal peoples. The results of the commission, perhaps the first of its kind in the world, were suppressed. In one last attempt, Faisal tried to claim what he believed was due the Arabs. Faisal proclaimed an Arab government with the right to rule over all the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. And that government remained in Damascus until the French wanted to cash their check. When French colonial troops marched in and deposed Faisal, British Prime Minister Lloyd George flatly said, the friendship of France is worth 10 Syrias. But with the self-determination genie out of the bottle, Britain and France had to look less imperialistic. Instead of colonies, the Middle East would be divided into mandates, a term invented at the Paris Peace Conference. Mandate territories were to be governed temporarily to help them prepare for independence. The idea of mandates is that the Western powers, the civilized nations, mainly white nations, were going to take it upon themselves to civilize their darker skinned brothers around the world and to make it so that these new nations could spare the stress of the modern world. The fiction was that uh, this was in some way a relationship that's not coercive that's in some way taking into account the aspirations of local peoples. But the reality was it was just simply old-fashioned colonialism. Behind closed doors, the two allies agreed to follow the general outline of the Sykes-Picot Accord and ignore Arab demands. They divided up the territory and arranged to share oil revenues. But where exactly would France's mandate end and Britons begin. Many of the lines, many of the boundaries were drawn clearly with a ruler on somebody's map in London or in Paris. They were off in the desert, it didn't matter too much exactly from their point of view. From the point of view of local people, of course, these new boundaries came to mean something. You couldn't go from point A to point B as you might have in the old days under the Ottomans. You could saunter over. Now there was a national frontier and you needed papers and documentation or you had to sneak across the border risk being apprehended and imprisoned. Sykes-Picot was just the beginning of playing with boundaries. France created a new nation, Lebanon, with a Christian majority, splitting it off from a Muslim, Syria. Britain clumped together three former Ottoman provinces along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and called them Iraq. What the British had done is they had patched together three groups of people. In the north were, uh, was predominantly Kurdish, in the center was predominantly Sunni Arab, in the south was predominantly Shi'i Arab. Kurds, for example, had gone to Paris demanding their own right to self-determination, and yet now they were included in this Iraqi state. In Palestine, British control meant increased Jewish immigration, 
France and Britain were quite satisfied with their handiwork. The people on the ground were not. Certainly by the end of the First World War, and uh, definitely after the declaration of the Belfort Declaration, um, there was an awareness that things were changing. And perhaps even more important to stress is that the change involved um, certainly Jews, but Jews who were also primarily Europeans. And in that sense, they probably elicited more hostility than their neighbors next door who had lived there forever. Throughout the, the region, there were rebellions um, against foreign rule. There were nationalist revolts in Iraq, in Syria, in Palestine. The British, I think, were surprised by this, and the French in Syria as well when they faced rebellions. Uh, colonial powers, I think, generally like to think that they're there for the benefit of the native population and leading them towards a, a better life and greater civilization. The natives tend not to see things that way and feel that they're capable of ruling themselves and that, that foreign rule is, is not in their country's interests uh, and that they should go home. Britain used real brutal force to put down the rebellion. Some people think that up to 10,000 uh, Iraqis died in those anti-British activities. They mounted huge operations, air operations. It was a, a, a policy of, of pacification that the British and the French uh, pursued in the name of taming rebellions and in the name of civilization and modernization and the rule of law. But Britain could not afford to keep up direct military control. In a hastily called conference in Cairo, Winston Churchill, the new head of the colonial office, took out the map and subdivided Britain's mandates again. He created it in 1921, Transjordan, which had never existed. There had never been a people called the Transjordanians. Churchill's thinking was this way, if we create Transjordan, therefore we satisfy Arab demands for an independent state, and we satisfy Zionist demands for immigration into Palestine. And so the British thought that they were this way, sort of uh, resolving contradictory promises. To further look like they were keeping their promise to the Arabs, the British invited Sharif Hussein's family, who'd led the Arab revolt, to manage the rest of their Middle East real estate as figureheads. Hussein's son, Faisal, was made king of Iraq, a place he'd never been to before. Another son, Abdullah, became king of Transjordan. Transjordan was not economically viable. It had few towns. Uh, it had a very small population altogether, much of which was nomadic or semi-nomadic. Abdullah and Transjordan survived on British subsidies for decades. But Britain could not pull all the strings it wanted. It tried and failed to make Sharif Hussein king of Western Arabia. Instead, Hussein's forces fell to those of another tribal chieftain, Ibn Saud, who then established the new state of Saudi Arabia, named after his own family. And when the wartime allies tried to break up the Ottoman heartland, a former Ottoman officer, Mustafa Kemal, fought and won a war of independence and created the nation of Turkey. Britain and France had to satisfy themselves with Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Transjordan, and Iraq. In all these places, the British implemented some of the kinds of policies they had ruled by elsewhere. Um, in large measure, divide and rule. They tended to favor some segments of the local population over others. And this, of course, in the long run, had unpleasant consequences because it undermined various relations among ethnic and religious communities, which had been in place for decades or centuries in some cases. So by definition, the partition has created a smaller, weaker, more dependent uh, states. The Middle East mandates finally proved too expensive and unruly to maintain. And by the 1940s, all of them were independent states. But with the discovery in the region of the world's largest oil deposits, unrest and great power meddling continued. <laughs>
Abdullah was eventually assassinated, though his family continues to rule Jordan. In Iraq, Faisal's descendants were murdered and replaced by military strongmen. Lebanon was torn apart by a bitter civil war, and Syria fell into the hands of an authoritarian dynasty. For a long time, many Arabs saw the, the governments of the separate Arab states as, as rather illegitimate, uh, and saw the existence of those states themselves as illegitimate, because there was a sense that all the Arabs were one nation, with one history and one common destiny, and should be united politically. But the dream of a united Arab state received another blow when the world went to war again, and yet another line was drawn in the Middle East. In the wake of the immense human tragedy of the Holocaust, Palestine was partitioned to create the new state of Israel. That line simultaneously created a new category of refugees, Palestinians, whose lives have remained intertwined with those of their fellow Arabs. In a complicated relationship, you have a pan-Arab identity, and people in Egypt feel strongly about the issue of Palestine. It's a hot issue across the Arab world. People feel that, that what happens to the Palestinians has some bearing on their lives, on the one hand. On the other hand, there, are, there is also a very strongly rooted sense of Egyptian identity, which is different from Libyan identity or Algerian identity or Syrian identity. When Arab activists and reformers began working for more representative government in the early 1900s, no one could have predicted the tinderbox of volatile states their descendants would inherit. They thwarted uh, nationalist sentiments, the demise of secular Arab nationalism, paved the way, inevitably, I think, to the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. The way that you draw borders is obviously of tremendous long-term consequence. And so in a sense, we absolutely can say that the sort of like imperial messing around with, with borders is, of course, a messing around with people's identities. That obviously is a very, very dangerous thing to do. No line is ever so straight as to suggest that there are no other influences. I mean, it's a very complex history of the Western powers. He ended up sowing the seeds of hatred, which would come back to haunt them. 